And it's about to pop up on the screen now. And it really started, I was thinking about this quote from Poe, in letters as in government, we require a declaration of independence. A better thing still would be a declaration of war. Poe wrote that in the Broadway Journal in 1845, a magazine he was editing at the time. So 1845 is quite a bit after the actual signing of the Declaration of Independence. So you think by then, maybe America would have established its identity, wouldn't need this declaration. What exactly is Poe getting at? Why exactly does he think we need to have some kind of war? So I'm trying to unpack what this statement means. And just to put you in a little bit of context, Poe was born in 1809, the same year as Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln. So he's quite a bit after the revolution, but it's still a new country and people weren't quite sure if this experiment was really gonna work out or not. But just to get us started, do any of you know which of Poe's tales is set in a real place that's named in its title? Now, Poe wrote lots of specific locations into his stories like the Pits and the Pen Pendulum is Toledo and the Murders in the Rue Morgue is Paris. The Man of the Crowd is London. So some of you might think, well, maybe the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Well, that's actually a novel, so that doesn't count. And that actually starts out in New Bedford. So he's from Nantucket, but the story's action starts out in New Bedford. What about Morning in the Wissahickon? That's not a short story either. That's more of a sketch. So that brings us to a tale of the Ragged Mountains. So all of you from Albemarle and Charlottesville should have recognized the tale of the Ragged Mountains. You might have actually walked through the Ragged Mountains yourselves. This is a photo I took a while back. I was standing on top of a mountain. The guy who owned it said that this was the actual Ragged Mountain that Poe was writing about. I don't know what he had to back that up, but this is a good view from the top of the mountain he used to own. Wouldn't it be nice to own your own mountain? But Poe was in the area, as we should know, he went to the University of Virginia. He was only the second class to ever attend. It was in 1826. It was 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And he lived for a while, they said, on the lawn, but then had a fight with his roommate and ended up on the West Range, which were guests is either room 13 or room 17, but I think UVA determined it's going to be 13 because it's a lot creepier sounding than 17. So this is the Poe dorm room there. And as you can see, there's a glass door outside. You can take a little peek inside and see maybe how the room would have been arranged while Poe was living there. And you can imagine Poe might have been sitting in that corner right there while he was writing some of his early poetry or maybe one of his first short stories. So this is the campus that Poe knew. And we do know that while Poe was there, Jefferson was there. And Jefferson, the founder, lived not too far away at Monticello. That's not Monticello, there we go. So people have posed the question, would Poe have met Jefferson? There's even a play that's been written about Poe meeting Jefferson. What would they talk about? One of the early films they made about Poe's life, I believe The Loves of Edgar Allan Poe, portrays Poe as a college student meeting Jefferson. And Jefferson's known to have taken students up to Monticello to have dinner with him. But I think that if Poe actually did meet Jefferson, he would have bragged about it. He would have mentioned it in some of his letters, and we just don't have any letters where he mentions having met Jefferson. So it's a shame. It's a possibility something that could have happened, but just didn't happen, unfortunately. But Poe grew up under the shadow of Jefferson. He grew up in Richmond. The building was still standing where Jefferson had composed the Virginia, Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom which you know, said that you know, now that we're not part of England anymore, we don't all have to go to the same church. 
we have that freedom of religion. This led into the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, that freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all this really started right here in Richmond. Also, Pogue up in the shadow of the Virginia State Capitol, which I consider Jefferson's architectural Declaration of Independence. When he was commissioned in the 1880s to design a capital for this commonwealth, he said, well, obviously we've just gained our independence from Great Britain. We don't wanna make this look like British architecture. We should design a new kind of public building that tells the story of who we are and it should reflect the great republics of the past. So he looked to a Roman Republican building, the Maison Carré in France, and that's what he's created here. So that this would tell people, just as you're walking up towards it, what this new country is about. This is a republic. This is a country for the people and by the people. Although unfortunately he used an imperial period building, but we can overlook that. And maybe Poe did visit Monticello. It said that when Jefferson died, which we all know was on July 4th, it was the 50th anniversary of the sign of the Declaration of Independence. And there were people in Charlottesville who wanted to go and attend the funeral and apparently there was some fighting over who got to lead the procession and Poe just, according to legend, just walked right up there. Now it's a bit of a hike, but Poe's known to have walked from Baltimore to Washington DC, so I think he was maybe up for it. But in addition to Jefferson, I think there was somebody who really would have made a much bigger impression on Poe. It was one of Poe's professors at UVA. George Tucker. And Tucker was a politician. He was in the Virginia House of Delegates. He was in the US Congress. He was a very accomplished author. In 1824, two years before Poe went to UVA, he wrote The Valley of Shenandoah, which is considered one of the first novels actually set in America. In 1827, the year after Poe met him, he wrote A Voyage to the Moon, one of our first science fiction novels. And in addition to that, he wrote a lot about philosophy, about poetry. And if you know a little bit about Poe, you'll think maybe some of these ideas that he's expressing might have inspired Poe, like one of them. Music is the foundation of poetry. Well, Poe did later say that poetry is the rhythmical creation of beauty. Here's another one. A composition must have a certain degree of singleness. And that sounds a lot like Poe's theory of unity of effect, that every sentence, every line, every syllable should lead to a common effect. How about this, the goal of a poem is pleasure. Another one of these ideas we see reflected in Poe's criticism later. How about this? A writer should begin with the tone with which he means to proceed arranging the composition so that no one may, so that each part may seem to arise naturally from the other until it gradually reaches its conclusion. And that also sounds a lot like Poe. He wrote a whole article, this is Poe wrote the philosophy of composition about how in the Raven, everything leads up to the common effect of melancholy that he's trying to achieve. I mean, the sounds, the word nevermore, he repeats at the end of each stanza because he says that increases the feeling of melancholy. So yeah, it looks like Tucker had a huge impact on Poe. We don't usually acknowledge that, but Poe would have met him at UVA. But UVA didn't go too well for Poe. Apparently, they want you to pay your tuition. And at the time, it was the most expensive school in the country with room and board and everything came out to about $350 a year, which doesn't sound like much today. But then you look back, you say, well, Poe working at a magazine here in town a decade later was making about $500 a year. So that's quite a bit of money. 
Now, Poe's foster father could have afforded this. He was worth about three quarters of a million dollars. This wouldn't have been a huge expense for him. But Poe decided he wanted to study ancient and modern languages. Now, his foster father was a tobacco exporter, and he probably would have preferred that Poe had studied mathematics, arithmetic, something that would have helped him take over the tobacco export business. But Poe had other sites. He wanted to be a poet, and he just didn't make a living as a poet back then. If you think about the great poets back then, like, say, William Cullen Bryant, he was a lawyer. Or later on, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a professor at Harvard who also had family money. Poe probably wanted to be a professor. That way he'd have the freedom to write poetry in his own time, but it just didn't work out that way. Mr. Allen only sent him there with $110. So Poe's in debt from the time he got there, couldn't afford to stay, started gambling to raise extra money, couldn't pay off the money he'd borrowed. And before you know it, he's just deeper in debt. Some estimates have him about $2,000 in debt after his first term. So even though he finished up that term fourth in his class in Latin, fifth in his class in French, really good student, considering Mr. Allen wouldn't give him a French textbook, Poe couldn't afford to stay. And then he, at the age of 18, came back to Richmond, then ran away from home, said, I'm gonna be a great poet. And he went to the great publishing center in the United States, Boston. So he published that little book on the left, Tamerlane, a self-published job, not very well published, it looks almost like a really flimsy pamphlet and he couldn't afford to pay for this. So he never owned a copy of his own first book. It wasn't distributed because he'd never paid for it. This one you can see was at one point used as a coaster. Look at the little water ring on there. This is a $640,000 toaster. It's the most valuable book in American literature. So just if you're ever in a flea market and you see this, you might wanna go ahead and donate that to the Poe Museum. So the book was less than a flop, it really didn't get distributed. So Poe decided he's gonna see the world, have all sorts of adventures, he enlisted in the US Army, and he published a second book of poetry when he was 20 years old, it's the one on the right, Alaraf, Tamerlane and Minor Poems. This one, it's a pretty valuable book too. It got a little bit of notice not a lot, but it's starting to get Poe acknowledged out there. I think one critic said that it's a bunch of nonsense, but it's exquisite nonsense. And we can expect far greater things from this poet in the future. So Poe's on his track. He's not making a living off his poetry, but at least his works are getting noticed. They're getting reviewed. And then he went to the United States Military Academy at West Point and his fellow cadets chipped in to publish a book of his funny poems. You ever read any of Poe's funny poems? Well, they didn't actually make it into the book. Instead, he used the money and he published a bunch of pretty melancholy poetry, like the sleeper, oh, the lady sleeps, soft around from where the worms creep. It's a love poem about decomposing corpse with maggots and worms crawling. It's not very funny stuff. And his fellow cadets were furious. They had paid a lot of money to help him publish this book and they're probably gonna take it out on him, but he'd already been kicked out by then. So they really couldn't do much. He was court-martialed and expelled from West Point before that. But this book, he's 22 years old. He included a preface in the form of a letter to the publisher, a letter to B, probably Elliam Bliss, the publisher. And he spells out, you know, what he thinks is wrong with American literature at the time and what's the great barrier to an American author's success. What's standing in the way? These guys, the British writers, everybody in America wants to read British authors. And this is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth, but I could name any number of them. We've got Pope there, Sir Walter Scott, Mary Shelley, Bobby Burns, Lord Byron, I mean, you name it. And it's a lot easier to get your works published if you're a British author in the United States because there's no international copyright law. So the American publishers didn't have to pay the British authors. They just 
bought one of the books and reprinted it. So why do you want to pay this American author who may or may not sell if you can just already find a successful British author and republish them? And people in the United States were still deferring to the British. They're the great ones. And we need to defer to their judgment. And Poe writes in his preface, you're aware of the great barrier in the path of an American writer. If he has read at all, in, in preference to the combined and established wit of the world, I say established, for it is with literature, as with both with law or empire, an established name is a state in tenure or a throne in possession. Besides, one might suppose that books like their authors improve by travel. Their having crossed the sea is with us so great a distinction. So just because it was written overseas, it, it must be good if, if it came across the ocean. Our antiquaries abandon time for distance. Our very flops glance from the binding to the bottom of the title page where the mystic characters which spell London, Paris, or Genoa are precisely so many letters of recommendation. So he's saying that the American readers just sort of look at the title page and if it says London at the bottom, oh, that must be good. So Poe's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder here. He's saying, well, it's way easier for them to publish your works here. And what's the problem, does he say, with relying on British literature as an example? They are the mother country after all. Well, he says that there's a great barrier here that we're mixing up judgment with opinion. We need to have good judgment. And the difficulty, he says, lies in the interpretation of the words judgment or opinion. The opinion is the world's, that, that anybody can have opinion. The, his example here is a fool, for example, thinks Shakespeare a great poet, yet the fool has never read Shakespeare. And his, the fool's neighbor, who's a step higher in the Andes of the mind, whose head that is to say, his more exalted thought is too far above the fool to be seen or understood, but whose feet, by which I mean his everyday actions are sufficiently near to be discerned. That neighbor asserts that Shakespeare is a great poet and the fool believes him. And it's henceforth his opinion. This neighbor's own opinion has, in like manner, been adopted from above him. And so ascending to a few gifted individuals who kneel around the summit, beholding face to face the master spirit who stands upon the pinnacle. So everybody's deferring to somebody else that Shakespeare's a great poet, but it's all just opinion. And Poe also goes on to criticize the poets of his own day. What's wrong with those British metaphysical poet? Well, they're focusing on instruction rather than effect. He says, as I'm speaking of poetry, it will not be amiss to touch slightly upon the most singular heresy in its modern history, the heresy of what was called very foolishly the Lake School. Some years ago, I might have been induced by an occasion like the present to attempt formal refutation of their doctrine. At present, it would be a work of superinterrogation the wise must bow to the wisdom of such men as Coleridge and Southey, but being wise have laughed at poetical theories so prosaically exemplified. So to proceed, he who pleases of, is of more importance to his fellow men than he who instructs. Since utility is happiness and pleasures end already obtained. So Poe goes on to state that the problem with these metaphysical poets is they have a philosophy that poetry should be instructive, but the whole point of being instructive, the whole point of any philosophy is happiness. So why not skip the middleman instead of having someone instruct you be on how to be happy, why not have a poem that makes you happy? Just skip over the middle part there. So what is the true purpose of poetry? If it's not instruction, and here he says, 
that what is poetry? What is poetry? And he says here, I demanded of some scholar some time ago, give me a definition of poetry. So we can imagine maybe he was asking Tucker, how do you define poetry? Maybe Poe was asking one of his headmasters here in Richmond, how do you define poetry? And Poe says that the scholar just gave him a dictionary, says that's how you define poetry. But Poe says, no, that's not it. He says that a poem, in my opinion, is opposed to work of science by having for its immediate object pleasure, not truth, to romance by having for its object an indefinite instead of a definite pleasure, being a poem only insofar as its object is attained, romance presenting perceptible images with definite. So prose or fiction has definite images, poetry has indefinite sensations to which end music is an essential. Since the comprehension of sweet sound is our most, most indefinite conception, music, when combined with a pleasurable idea, is poetry. Music without the idea is simply music. The idea without the music is prose from its very definitiveness. So we've got Poe saying that it sounds a lot like George Tucker here, that music is essential to poetry, that just like poetry acts on our emotions in indefinite, non-specific ways, just the, the sound of it alone, so can poetry. So what did Poe's fellow cadets at West Point think of this great essay and the collection of weird poetry it contained? Well, this is the copy that the Poe Museum owned. And on the front page here, it's signed by the father of one of his fellow cadets. This book is a damn cheat. All it fills 124 pages could be composed in 35. It said that his fellow cadets threw most of the copies in the Hudson River, just get rid of them. They hated it, they despised him, and they were still a little bit upset that he wasted their money on it. So not the best start to your poetic career. It would be 14 years before Poe published another book of poetry. That was after The Raven became a big hit. So then he turned to journalism, to magazines, and he got a job at the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond, and that's his desk and chair on the left side there. We actually have the chair on display at the Poe Museum so you can come and see it. The building is no longer standing, but they used the bricks and the grant to build the garden here at the museum. And when Poe got the job here, Richmond was not known as a literary town by any means. So like six years later, Charles Dickens came to town and some of the magazine editors in town had a big dinner for him and they admitted Mr. Dickens, we've never actually read any of your work, but our wives tell us it's pretty good. And we can tell from the writers of the time commenting on this that Richmond was known as a political city. Its journals were political. The main magazines in town were the Richmond Inquirer, which was the Bible of the Democrats, and the Richmond Whig. So the rival political parties had their papers. And they thought this new country, this new experience, experiment and representative government just might not last. We have to fight for it. And it came down to it. Let's talk just about the journalist in Richmond who died in duels during these years. James Callender, Meriwether Jones, John Daly Burke, Skelton Jones, John Hampton Pleasance, who was the editor of the Richmond Whig, all died in duels. And his rival, James T. Callender, mysteriously drowned in three feet of water. So this is a dangerous place to get into journalism. And a fellow named Thomas White decided this place needed a magazine, not about politics, but about art and literature, the Southern Literary Messenger, devoted to every department of literature and the fine arts. And this is the first issue from 1834. And even from opening up the front page, you see editorials written about congratulations for starting a literary paper in Richmond of all places. Virginia needs literature. They need educated men who can 
cultivate literature in the South rather than just political writings. And back then, all the great writers were up north. You think about James Fenimore Cooper, New York, Washington Irving, New York. But here's another passage from the editorials that were, were doomed forever to kind of vastly to our northern neighbors, dependence for our literary food upon our brethren. So we're always dependent upon the outsiders, the northerners, that here it says that we're doomed to continue to be consumers of northern productions. If we continue to be consumers of northern literature, we'll never ourselves become producers. So how does our Poe respond when he got the job here? He knows this is very specifically a magazine about cultivating literature in the South. So what Poe did, the first thing he did was publish a short story. And he was told that stories here should educate and entertain without offending people. The purpose was to educate. They wanted to cultivate this Southern literary scene. So Poe published Berenice. It's about a man named Aegis with a one-track mind. He can see a spot on the wall and stare at it for so long, he goes into a self-induced trance. One day he sees his wife smile. He can think of nothing else but her precious pearly white teeth. But then she gets sick and she wastes away. She's buried in the family cemetery. So naturally he digs her up and he plucks out all of her teeth. Only later realizing she'd accidentally been buried alive, but he was so entranced with her teeth that he didn't even notice that he was ripping them out of a living body. And it's a gory, disgusting tale, especially for 1835. Got angry letters to the magazine. There were editorials and other journals saying, this is injurious to the public morals. This is worse than violent video games and comic books put together. You should ban this. And Poe almost got fired, but he wrote his boss a letter which still survives in which he says, trust me, this is what's gonna sell. This is what we need. Sure that, you know, they tell you that we should write things that educate and entertain, but that's not what the public wants. We should not go with what the critics tell us the public needs, but with what the public demands. And what do they demand? Well, he says, he gives a whole description of what kind of stories, the fearful colored into the horrible, the witty exaggerated into the burlesque, the singular raw down to the strange and mystical. You may say that it all is in bad taste. I have my doubts about it. But, you know, let's see what the audience says. These, they may or may not be in bad taste, but they're what the public craves to be appreciated. You must be read. And these things are invariably sought after with avidity. He says, if you want to see if this is a good story or not, look at the circulation of your magazine. Leave it up to the public. The critics have failed us. Leave it up to what the public has to say. And he's, he also points out the first men in Europe have not thought that writings of this are unworthy of their talents. So we can bring this sort of thing to the United States too. We need to stand up to them. We need to compete on their own level. And he says, I'm gonna furnish you one of these stories every month. And its effect will be alluded to. It's better estimated by the circulation of the magazine by any comments upon its content. So let's, let's let this be democratic. Let's see what the public wants. And so Pog got the job and the circulation of the magazine increased seven times in the first 17 months, made them leading journal in the South and it gained the magazine a national reputation. So now Poe was there and this is a guy who at age 22 was already telling American critics how they should do their job. American writers what they should do so now he had the chance he decided he's going to write some book reviews and I mentioned James Fenimore Cooper, Last of the Mohicans, Washington Irving, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He's got to take those guys down or not. He said in one of his reviews of James Fenimore Cooper he just didn't understand plot. The people only read his works because they were set in American settings. It's the easiest thing in the world to just write something in about American setting but he didn't have any creativity that you need to hold up literature to a higher standard that up until now, American authors had just been puffed up. The practice of author critics sometimes accepting bribes, but just puffing up books I hadn't even read. 
with showers of praise. Washington Irving, he posts, that was the most overrated writer in America. Didn't stop him later from asking his assistants and asking to write a little opinion about one of Poe's stories, but yeah, Poe thought it's time to hold some of our writers of the day up to higher standards, that the popular ones weren't necessarily the best. He actually said, you know, this, this young writer out of New England, this Nathaniel Hawthorne fellow, now that's a great writer. This is a guy who has some promise that we're going to be reading him long after we stop reading Cooper and the rest of these. So maybe Poe is right about Hawthorne there. For Longfellow, he became the most popular poet in the country, rich, famous, beloved. And Poe said that, well, he's a little bit quacky himself, but he's followed by a whole legion of literary quacks. He has no original ideas, but he does a fairly good job of stealing other people's ideas. And he committed the greatest sin, plagiarism. He thought he was too similar to Alfred, Lord Tennyson, the great British poet that he was just sort of a copyist. And the worst thing you could do for Poe is be a copyist. You have to be original, you have to be yourself. So he time and time again liked to trash Longfellow in print. And he did a whole series of articles he called the, the Little Longfellow War, where he just trashed Longfellow, went line by line picking out where he thought Longfellow would plagiarize things. And Longfellow goes, he's so rich and famous, he doesn't even dignify these things with a response. Somebody else by the name of, pseudonym of Aldous wrote Poe back and accused him of plagiarism. Some people have accused Poe of being Aldous just so he could keep the thing going. So Poe continued to try to hold up American literature to higher standards. And he wrote a series of articles, just here's one, American novel writing where he tried to explain what's holding back American authors from really claiming their fair share in the world literature. First of all, he said low standards, that the critics aren't holding us up. And then of course, the corruption of the critics. In truth, the corrupt nature of our ordinary criticism become a byword and a reproach. He says that the critics of today are accepting bribes to write nice reviews. He says, this is absolutely contemptible he calls it petty and contemptible bribery, properly called. It's a system even more injurious to real literature and the interests of the public. So how is this hurting the public? Well, when the critics are just puffing each other up, but the public is saying something completely different, who's right here? Whose opinion should we go with? And we can see with a lot of websites online that the critics might love a movie that the public absolutely despises and the critics, for whatever reason, they have maybe some other agenda, they absolutely hate a movie that the public loves. So Poe's saying, maybe we should go with the public says, maybe this should be a more democratic thing. And about this time, 1841, a fellow named Rufus W. Griswold, one of the big critics of the day, issued the first major anthology of American poetry. So he's another one who's saying, well, we should be noticed. We should make sure that the British know that we have poetry that's every bit as good as theirs. So what do you think Poe thought of the poets and poetry of America? Well, he said that Griswold was taking more bribes and is mostly his friends in the book that there were poets today are completely forgotten who had Dozens of poems included. Meanwhile, Poe only got three of his poems into it. So maybe Poe is a little bit bitter there. But Poe said, yeah, we need to clear up some of the corruption in our criticism. So what's the cure? Again, focus over good judgment over opinion. Opinion he thought was just something that had been passed down and we just accepted it because somebody else told it. We need to exercise good judgment over what's good. And also the other cure, honest critics. Now about this same time, 1837, so this is the same year Poe left the Southern Literary Messenger and went on to work at magazines in Philadelphia, then later into New York. Emerson gave a, a lecture at Harvard, the American Scholar, which Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. called the Declaration of Independence of American Intellectual Life. Now, Emerson and Poe are completely different personalities. They're roughly contemporary, but you couldn't be more different. And 
he tried to explain, you know, what should the, what he called the man thinking, what should he be? He should be rather, rather than a mere thinker, he should be something better than just a parrot of other men's thinking. I think this is something that Poe could have sympathized with. This is something that's in the air that we need to stop just accepting opinion that's been passed down to us from on high and stop being parrots of other men's thinking. So I think maybe Poe would have gone, gone along with that. We can't be overly reliant upon traditional and historical views. I should think he would have gone along with that. We should learn from nature and the past through the way of books and action and experience. And maybe Poe could go with that because Poe believed that we should have a, several different ways of experiencing the world, be it inductive reasoning where we make observations, form a hypothesis, test it, or deductive reasoning where we try to make things fit into different axioms but he also thought we needed intuition and imagination. Now also Emerson thought that the man thinking should defer never to the, to the popular cry. That, so maybe that's a little bit different than Poe. Poe thought, you know, maybe public opinion has something. Emerson's thinking a little bit different, but Emerson also thought we were all fragments of a greater creature, kind of like fingers in a big hand. And, I think that's where he diverged a little bit from Poe. Poe thought this is a little bit far out. He actually accused Emerson, the transcendentalist that have followed him of being sometimes weird for the sake of being weird. And then Emerson also thought the man thinking has a duty to the rest of humanity, that the man thinking should be instructive and educational, edifying. And that's really, I think, where Poe differs the most from this other idea of what should define American literature, that we shouldn't try to instruct, we should just try to make an impact. And another essay, the American Poetry, Poe comments on these transcendentalists by the, but critical heresies such as these are but a softened expression or reflection of the ruling cant of the day. By the ruling cant of the day, we mean the disgusting practice of putting on the airs of an owl and endeavoring to look miraculously wise, the affectation of a second sight, of a species of ecstatic prescience, of an intensely bathetic penetration into all sorts of mysteries, psychological ones in especial, an orphic, an ostrich affectation, which buries its head in balderdash, and seeing nothing itself fancies, therefore, that its preposterous carcass is not a visible object of derision for the world at large, an affectation particularly in vogue just now among a knot of miserable bedlamites in Boston. Yeah, he's talking about the transcendentalist and Emerson's gang, a clique of pitiable dunderheads who go about babbling in parables and swearing by Carlisle with a leer in one eye and a mass of lacrimose hair plastered carefully of the other a set of thumb-sucking babes and idiots who could not do a better thing for their own comfort and that of a community that blow out the exceedingly small modicum of hasty pudding, which they imagine to be their brains. So, ouch. And he goes on to even parody the kind of reviews the transcendentalists write. He says, by, let us, by way of exemplification, imagine one of these gentlemen reviewing, as he calls it, Paradise Lost. He would describe, discourse it as thus. The Paradise Lost is the earnest outpouring of the oneness of the psychological man. It has the individuality of the true singleness. It is not to be regarded as a poem, but as a work, as a multiple theogony of a manifestation of the works of the days, is opinion for the progress, a wheel in the movement that moveth ever and goeth away, a mirror of self-inspection held up to the seer of the age essential, of the age in esse, for the seers of the ages possible and posse, we hail a brother in the work. So that's Poe making fun of the way the transcendentalists write and their version of criticism. So that brings us to the Broadway Journal, 1845 and and Poe's statement that in letters as in government, we require a declaration of independence. A better thing still would be a declaration of war. But he starts by saying, 
why must we stop looking to British critics for approval? Well, because we know they're not looking out for our best interest. He says, we know the British to bear us little but ill will. We know that in any case, they do not utter unbiased opinions of American books. We know that a few instances in which our writers have been treated with common decency in England, these writers have either openly paid homage to in English institutions or have had lurking at the bottom of their hearts a secret principle at war with democracy. We know all this and yet day after day submit our necks to the degrading yoke of the crudest opinion that emanates from the fatherland. Now, if we must have nationality, let it be nationality, we'll throw off this yoke. So we can't keep looking to the fatherland. We can't keep looking to opinions handed down to us. We've got to trust ourselves. But if we do trust ourselves, if we do trust the American audience, if we do trust our own judgment, how will American audience be able to, how will American authors be able to compete on the world stage? How can they stand up to these British authors who are being reprinted here for free? an international copyright law. And Poe worked up until his death. He actually agreed with Charles Dickens on this, on establishing international copyright law so that publishers couldn't keep doing their work. So what will Poe's version of American literature look like? Well, he says that much has been said of late about the necessity of maintaining a proper nationality in American literature, but, but what will this be? He's saying that, see, uh, but the need of that nationality depends on our own literature. Let's say I got the piece right here. Much has been said of late about the necessity of maintaining a proper nationality in American letters, but what this nationality is or what is to be gained by it has never been distinctly understood. That American should confine himself to American themes or even prefer them is rather a political than a literary idea. And at best is a questionable point. So yeah, it's, this is an idea that, you know, he was accusing that Cooper of just setting his stories in American locations that doesn't make American literature. He said that that's just more of a political thing. Poe also said the new literature is trending magazine words. It's trending towards the mass audience. Magazines are a lot cheaper than books. More people can afford them. And he said that American literature should cater to that new audience. They want short stories rather than a long novel. They want serialized novels. They want short stories, short poems, short articles. He said the world is speeding up and that's what American literature should look like. He also said that now the poem should exist for the poem's sake, that it should no longer teach you something or try to edify you. It should just be a great poem for its own sake. That American literature should also show originality. The great sin is to copy. Remember what he thought of Longfellow. Should never imitate should always do something new. He said that not one of my stories is going to be like the other. I'm going to completely reinvent myself every time. Modernity, which for Poment, come up with new expressive forms in literature, new genres. He invented a detective story. He experimented with different poetic forms, new technology. Poe writes about the new technology. That's why he's considered one of the founders of science fiction. He also incorporates a new technology into his production. He knows that printing presses and magazines are really taken off. He also did experiments with anesthetic printing, which would be similar to the Xerox machine. He was trying to find new ways to incorporate technology into his works. Rejection of old world values, and of course, individuality. And that's the great thing that we should always point to deeply personal stories and that manifest the individual, that we're not just fingers on a hand, that we're all part of the same. But he said, to, if any ambitious man have a fancy to revolutionize at one effort, the universal world of human thought, human opinion, and human sentiment, the opportunity is his own. 
the road to a mortal renown lies straight, open, and unencumbered before him. All that he has to do is to write and publish a very little book. Its title should be simple. A few plain words, my heart laid bare, but this little book must be true to its title. Now it's very singular that with the rabid thirst for notoriety, which distinguishes so many of mankind, so many too, who care not a fig what is thought of them after death, that there should not be found one man having sufficient hardihood to write this little book, to say, to write, I say, there are 10,000 men who, if the book were once written, would laugh at the notion of being disturbed by its publication during their life. But to write it, there's the rub. No man dare write it. No man ever dare write it. No man could write it. If he dared, the paper would shrivel and blaze at every touch of the fiery pen. So a confessional literature, honest literature, that's what we need. And did it work? Well, these are just some of the world authors who were influenced, inspired by Poe. So it looks like maybe it's working. We've got Jules Verne on the top left there, the father of science fiction, Alfred Hitchcock, the filmmaker, Rene Magritte, the Belgian surrealist painter, Charles Baudelaire on the top right, the French decadent poet, bottom left there, Salvador Dali, who even wrote about Poe in his autobiography that it was Poe's specter that helped him write his autobiography. And then the Japanese author, Edogaro Rampo, who was one of the ones who popularized mystery fiction in Japan. Jorge Luis Borges and the bottom middle there, an Argentinian postmodernist writer, that's Neil Gaiman. And then over there on my screen, he's hidden, but that's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. But these are just authors that Poe has influenced or inspired. People who have written about Poe's inspiration. But let's look at the bigger picture. This was an infographic that was done a few years ago of the most influential poets. And we can see Shakespeare on the left side, really big, but on the right, right center, Edgar Allan Poe, look at all the different authors he's influenced, but more than that, look at the other American poets that are there probably because of him. He's the one that really kicked it off, that really helped put American literature on the world stage, not just by being popular overseas. Washington Irving was very popular in England, but by being influential, by actually having an impact on other nations and other authors, and he paved the way for other American authors, like just above him, that's Ezra Pound, below him, that's T.S. Eliot. Then we've got old Walt Whitman right there next to Shakespeare. So Poe really kicked off American literature being a player on the world stage. And if you're wondering, Whitman and Poe actually did meet. They're 10 years apart. Whitman was 10 years younger than Poe, and they met once, but didn't have much to say. I think Whitman was just dropping off some poems at Poe's magazine. So what part does Jefferson have to play? I think Jefferson influence probably had a lot to do with Poe growing up. He couldn't have escaped the influence of Jefferson in Richmond, living in the shadow of the Virginia State Capitol, going to University of Virginia. But also I think George Tucker, as we mentioned earlier, plays a huge role in defining who Poe would be as a poet. And then Poe going out and trying to change the world based on Tucker's theories. So I want to thank you for having me today. And if you ever get the chance, come visit the Poe Museum. And this is Mr. Pluto, one of the Poe Museum cats. But thanks for having me. And I'll hand it back to Sterling or whoever else would like to take over the next part. And I'm going to check the comments and see if we have any questions here from anybody. So Katie says, sounds like Poe was ahead of his time. Given this, do you think he would have fared better creatively and professionally today? Well, I do think that his copyrights would have been protected today. So he might have done a lot better and it would have been a lot easier to get his works published thanks to online forums and blogs. And knowing that his love of different 
technologies, I think he would have been into streaming service. He would probably would have been writing shows for Netflix or for Amazon Prime. And Dwight says, Poe and I share the same view on critics. And, and Trish says, the Poe Museum is hands down one of the best places in Richmond. Well, thanks, Trish. See, Trish likes it. You should all come now, right? Let's see if there's any up higher up that I missed there. Dwight says Shakespeare's sonnets were horrible. Oh, uh, Sterling Howe point out that John Adams' last words, Thomas Jefferson survives. Sad thing is Jefferson had already died, so it's, oops, he said it too late, but it sounded good. Um, Davida asked, did Poe write to be read aloud? His quotes always sound so good. Yes, especially his poetry. You've got to read the poetry aloud or it makes no sense at all. If you just say, read the bells, and it, on the page, it's just bells, 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 bells. But when you read it and you hear it, the tintinabulation that's musically wells from the bells, 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 bells. And a lot of these things that Poe wrote were designed to be speeches or lectures. He gave a whole lecture called American Poetry. So the words I was reading from Poe's essay about American poetry could have been very well been the words that he was saying on stage and people love to hear him read these things. I had a question about um, Poe's sense of patriotism towards literature and, and embracing that American viewpoint. Do you, do you think from his kind of struggles throughout his professional career to make his writing and his poetry be a profession and a job that would pay for itself was part of it like a pragmatic approach to saying, hey, people, let's do something, read American literature. I need, you know, a job. Or did yeah, he, he really thought that, through. yeah, he was the first major American writer to really try to make his living just off his writing. And I mentioned earlier that the writers of the day usually kept their day jobs, but Poe thought, you know, if we're going to take writing seriously, we have to devote ourselves entirely to poetry or entirely to fiction. And he would have loved it if he'd just been able to devote all of his attention to poetry, but the marketplace just wouldn't allow it. The lack of international copyright wouldn't have allowed it. But that was kind of his goal at the end. And yeah, he always had the marketplace in mind because he wrote for a mass audience and had to think about, well, what's going to sell? Mm -hmm. there, any questions any coming questions? through email on that sterling or anything uh, i am not seeing me on facebook um uh, dwight also points out that a lot of the writers today had wealthy families and that was another thing poe had a wealthy foster father but he was cut off and didn't inherit any money from him. And Trish says, would you say that Richmond has become the literary town that Poe envisioned? I'm not sure if it has or hasn't. It's definitely become no more as an art town and Vichu does have a good writing program, but I think Poe always thought that, that he was part of a world stage that it wasn't just restricted to one town, but gradually I think Richmond's getting there. It's definitely come a long way since the time Poe was here and definitely having a good art school like VCU just down the street from, from the Poe Museum. Uh, that would have been beyond his wildest dreams. We have one of the top rated art schools in the country right here. And Richard says, did Poe develop the idea for the Raven from Dickens and his Raven grip? Well, Poe actually did meet Dickens in Philadelphia and Dickens might have told him about grip, but Poe also could have, could have based it on 
rather Poe's fictional Raven grip or the Raven from Barnaby Rudge, they could have inspired. But Poe also knew people who had pet Ravens. And when Poe was writing the Raven, he later wrote that essay, The Philosophy of Composition, explaining how he wrote the Raven. And he says the main thing was to create the feeling of melancholy. The word nevermore just sounded melancholy. Even if you don't speak English, that O sound nevermore just sounds melancholy. So he, he wants to repeat that O sound at the end of each stanza. But it would just be comical if a person just kept saying nevermore over and over again. It'd be kind of funny after a while, but not if a bird that doesn't know what he's saying says it like a parrot. So he said, I thought first using a parrot, but then, wait a second, the parrot's too colorful. That ruins the melancholy effect I'm trying to achieve. So then he said, well, how about a raven? The black plumage enhances the feeling of melancholy that I'm trying to get with this poem. So yeah, maybe it's a little bit of Dickens and a little bit just he liked the black plumage of the raven and Dwight references something James Russell Lowell wrote a, a comical poem making fun of the critics of his day and then one of the verses was about Poe here comes Poe with his raven like Barnaby Rudge two parts genius three fifths or two parts genius three parts sheer fudge so well, that's Dar Barnaby Rudge. That's Dickens' novel about the raven. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for joining us. This has been great. I, I learned a great deal. It's very interesting. When did international copyright laws really come into effect? It wasn't until the 1890s, so it didn't make it in time for Poe or for Dickens. Yeah. There's one last question that popped up from a Mandy. Um, hey, Mandy. Uh, did Poe ever meet the Madisons while in the area? You know, Dolly met Dickens in DC after selling Montpelier. How about Poe? No, he never mentions having met her. So I'm guessing he probably didn't. There's no surviving letters where he mentions having met Dolly Madison. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, Sterling, you got a few things to sure out of here? Yeah, um, as always, everyone, please uh, send us any suggestions you have about future guests or topics. You can email me at programs at albemoralhistory.org. Uh, and remember, everything you do, everything we do as your historical society is because of your support. If you have not joined us as a member, please consider doing so. You can visit our website to join or give us a call. Uh, this special event is brought to you by the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society and our wonderful supporters like you. Thanks again, Chris, that was great. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone out there for joining us and supporting what we do. I'm Sterling Howe with Tom Chapman and we hope to see you on our next quaint and curious volume of Forgotten Lore. Till then, stay safe and support local history. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Have a great evening. <laughs>